this time I'd like to invite any kids to come forward for the children's message. Come on up. Well, I know. What is this thing right here? What do you think this is? This is? It's a hiking stick. It is a stick. It's a big, tall stick. I had a member of this church years ago make this for me because he thought I was a shepherd. And he said, I need a shepherd's hook, shepherd's crook, a shepherd's staff if, if I'm going to be a good shepherd. And, uh, and, and, I, and I really like it. It sits in my office, but it's a great walking stick. That's for, that's for sure. Do you know why shepherds would need a stick like this? What do you think? Well, it's not really for magic tricks, no. But, I mean, that would be awesome. Oh, if a wolf came, you could help to defend the sheep and stuff. What about if a, if a sheep's running off? Do you throw the stick at him? No. Oh. You do, this. you do this. You try to help. You use the stick to maybe help keep the sheep in line, right? Like that, right? You say, oh, you got to stay in line like that, right? You're helping the sheep to stay in line. Why, why, why would you need the sheep to stay together? Yes, ma'am. So they don't, they don't get eaten by the wolves, and they all follow the shepherd. The shepherd's staff is to keep all the sheep together so they follow the shepherd. Now, today, Jesus is going to see a crowd of people, and he's going to say, they're like sheep without a shepherd. And so what do you think Jesus is going to do? Do you think he gets the staff out, and he's like, all right, people, let's get it together, and he starts moving them around and hitting them and, and defending them off all the wolves. Do you think he's going to be tapping them with the staff? Yeah. No. No. <laughs> Although that would be a really fun story, yeah, but that's not what Jesus is going to do. You know what Jesus is going to do? He's going to teach them. He's going to talk to them about God, and he's going to show them God's will. Yes, ma'am. I'm getting the good stuff, y'all. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Jesus is going to teach them about God and God's will because Jesus wants us to follow God. And so when a shepherd uses a staff, God has given us Jesus to keep us to focus on God's will. Well, I don't think it's a good idea just to smack the sheep. I mean, I wouldn't like it if that was what happened into me. As a, sometimes I'm a good sheep and sometimes I'm not. Let's pray, shall we? Let's pray. <laughs> Good and gracious God, thank you for being with us. Thank you for wonderful children that have such great energy, for whispers, for your word, and for pointing us to do your will. Thank you for being a good shepherd to us. In your son's name we pray. Amen. There's a literary device that gets used in the New Testament, um, and, and it's something that the gospel writers and even the, uh, uh, some of the letters of Paul, they, they use to help people to know the stories, to be able to tell the stories, to remember the stories. Um, and the literary device can best be described as, as a verse, course, verse, or ABA, or even it would be like ABCBA, where you would have these stories that would kind of bookend another story, but they all related together. And what we have today is one of those bookends. We have the, the second bookend from the first one from two weeks ago. And I'm going to kind of explain it to you to let you kind of see how this plays out. Two weeks ago, we talked about Jesus inviting the disciples to go out two by two. And he taught them what to do. And there they're going out to heal and to teach and to preach and to exercise demons. And it also says that if you go into the home of someone and, and they don't welcome you, you don't let the dust settle. You just turn around and walk the other way. In other words, don't take offense if they don't want to hear it. Don't, that's seeking your will. We're here to do God's will. We're here to do God's work, so go and serve others this way. And then, last week, we heard about Herod, the middle story, um, and the center of this, which really gives us a good example of what it looks like when our self-will is just gone, gone rampant. And it's all about power, and he's power-hungry, and he refuses to see it from any other perspective, which is contrary to Jesus pointing us to God's will and God's way in the world. And so we have this great example of self-will versus God's will, and we talked about that last week. Today we have the, the other bookend, the latter bookend, where all of a sudden the disciples are now coming back after they have gone and done their thing. 
They've taught, they've healed, they've exercised demons. And I imagine them coming back and talking to Jesus, and it's like Peter's coming in, he's like, Jesus, you're not gonna, you're not gonna believe what I was able to do. There was this woman, and she was sick in her home, and I was able to touch, and we were able to heal, and, and then we had a meal together, and I just feel amazing that this is, this is happening. I can't believe that this is what we get to do. James and John show up, and they're like, oh my gosh, we went to this house, there were four people living there, and their roof was, was a mess, and we got to patch it, and we got to talk to them, and we had dinner together, and we got to experience experience God. It was so amazing. Even Thomas was saying, I really doubted this was going to work, but good stuff, Jesus. And then Jesus looks at all of the disciples and says, let's get away for a little while. You guys have been working hard. Come on, let's get in the boat. Let's go to a deserted place and rest because we can't even eat. So many things are happening around here. Now, that deserted place is an important thing because anytime Jesus wanted to get away to go reconnect with God, to recharge himself, he would go to a deserted place. And usually he's by himself and he's praying and he's spending time nurturing that relationship with God. In other words, asking God, what do you want me to be? Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? And now he's invited the disciples to come along. And so now they're going to go with him to this deserted place and discover what God's asking of them and continuing in their ministry. The issue is that they get into this boat, and I just like this visual of them like in a rowboat, all 12 of them just kind of rowing back and forth, and they're all smiling. Look what we've done. This is really cool. We're kind of floating on the Spirit right now. There's so many cool things are happening. But on the outsides of this lake are thousands of people that are seeing them, and they're flocking to go get them. Because the thing is, our Scripture says, not he, not Jesus, but them. People are coming to see them. They've heard about Jesus. They've heard about the miracles, the stories, the healings, all the things that Jesus does. Now they're hearing about the disciples. And the disciples are actually going out and doing things. In fact, he calls them apostles, the sent ones. And they're out there doing the same thing. And now the crowd wants more of them. And so I imagine the disciples and, and Jesus rowing across this lake. Meanwhile, thousands of people are running around it to get to the other side. And they finally make it. And they're there when they arrive. And they're just like, oh. Jesus, we really wanted more. We want more. Can you give us more? And Jesus gets out of the boat and he looks at them and they look like they are sheep without a shepherd. And instead of separating themselves to go away to a deserted place, he has compassion on them and he begins to teach them. And he continues to do what God has asked him to do. And he's living into this God's will. And the disciples are learning yet again that sometimes we don't even get that break. We're meant to serve others no matter the time or place. Now, the story that's missing in between here is Jesus then sits down on the lawn with all of these thousands of people, and he feeds over 5,000. Now, in Mark, there's a cool line, because in the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus looks at the disciples and says, okay, you give them something to eat. And he's continuing this relationship with them, sharing this power, inviting them to go out to do the will of God. And then we get to this part in the scripture today that we had where they are now in a boat again and they land at this place called Gisinarat. And they get off the boat there and another crowd meets them. But this time, the crowd is sick. They got people that are bleeding, people that are, that are really sick, people that are dying, people that have diseases and they're lining them up in the streets. Almost like a parade of just sickly people just laying on their mats. And they're doing so so that when Jesus walks through them, they might touch the fringe of his robe and they would be healed. Now, we've seen other stories like this, haven't we? There's a story of a woman sneaking into the crowd of people to touch the robe of Jesus so that way she can be healed. And when she touches the robe, Jesus is like, who touched me? And the disciples are like, how could you tell? Everybody's touching you right now, Jesus. And he's like, no, I felt my power leave. And this woman shows up and says, it was me. And he says, your faith has healed you. So it'd be easy for us to interpret this is the same thing that's happening in this story, where they're reaching out their hands, these sick people, so that way they, if, if only I could just touch Jesus, if I could just touch his face, if he could just kiss my forehead, if I could just touch his shirt, if I could just touch the, the, the little itty bitty fringe, the string that's dangling from his robe, if I could just touch that, I could be healed. And I'll be honest with you, that's how I have interpreted scripture and interpreted this story for my whole life until I read something this past week. The robe, the cloak that an observant Jewish person would wear would always have fringe on the bottom. In other words, it wouldn't be well hemmed like our clothing is nowadays. The best example I can give you is like, do you remember back in the 70s when we would take our jeans and cut them off, right? 
And after a while, you get the dangles that are hanging down. It's real cool, you know. Uh, we should bring that back, maybe. Anyway, um, but those are the fringes that are hanging down. And the fringes on the bottom of the cloak of these observant Jewish men meant this, that God's commandments are more important than my own desires. God's commandments are more important than my own desires. In other words, the fringe that's dangling from this cloak means I'm called to do God's will, not my will. And it's a daily reminder for these observant Jewish people. So these changes for me the story of these people that are laying down on their mats, that are holding out their hands to touch this fringe. Because it's not that they're wanting to touch Jesus. They're trying to get closer to God's will. These people don't have the ability to go into the temple. They're bleeding. They're sick. They're dying. They have diseases. They cannot go about and, and finalize all the things that they're supposed to do to fulfill all the commandments that have been asked them to, to observe all the laws of Moses. They can't possibly do it. This is the only thing that they have is to reach out to get close to God's will, this observant Jew that recognizes that God's commandment, God's will is more important than my own selfish desires, and they're reaching out to be as close as they can, and their faith heals as they reach out for God's will. Talk about a bookend to focus on what's God's will, what's my will, and how do we negotiate the two. I love this image because these people that are lying down I talked last week about how we're kind of like Herod, seeking our self-will. But we're also these people that are on these mats. Because maybe we have a disease. Maybe we're wrestling with, with cancer or diabetes or, or, or any other host of things that, are, that, that, that befall our humanity. Maybe we're wrestling with these diseases. But we too, even in that sick state, can reach out to find out, what do you want from me today, God? Maybe we're, we're broken uh, by, by a relationship or by a situation, or maybe there's some things on our hearts and minds that we've been holding on to for so long that we swear we're going to take it to the grave. Nobody else will ever find out about it. No, 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 no. They can't because if they did, oh, I would just be, they, they wouldn't love me anymore. They wouldn't like me anymore. Even that, even there, you can still reach out to touch the fringe, to be as close to God's will as possible. Maybe, maybe we're wrestling with addictions or, or, or alcoholism or any other host of things that, that, that we feel we're broken and we can't be made well. Even there, we have the ability to reach out, to touch the fringe, to be as close to God's will as possible because that's where faith heals. That's where faith heals. And maybe the faith heals the person that I'm with. Maybe the faith heals a group or a situation, or maybe the faith starts to work inside of me to heal the brokenness that I think that I am. Are we willing today, today, to reach out and just let the fringe of that cloak grace our fingertips and recognize how close we are to God's will right now and lean into it and watch faith heal. Amen.